Hello, my name is Taya Graham, and welcome to the Police Accountability Report. As we always say, the show has a single purpose, holding police accountable. But why is this important, and what does it mean? Well, the subject of the show will illustrate the purpose of what we do, and that conversation starts with a single phrase. No one is above the law. But first, I want you watching to know that if you have evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us, and we might be able to investigate. Please reach out to us in a private email at par at therealnews.com. And of course, you can message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter or Facebook. And please like and comment. You know I read your comments and I appreciate them. Now, the statement I made at the top of the show is a phrase politicians in Washington repeat all the time. It's an idea that's supposed to be indicative of our exceptionalism, that we are a nation of laws, something we hear over and over again, but we really don't take the time to scrutinize it. Generally, this phrase has been used to justify the impeachment of President Trump, that Trump's alleged lawlessness is an exception and that he has to be held to account. But the president's answer has been that he has absolute immunity and that the law doesn't apply to him. But he's not the first public official to make this claim. In fact, we're going to show today how an entire branch of government has made a practice of flaunting the law part of the institution itself. And of course, I'm talking about policing, but I'm not going to just tell you, I'm gonna show you. Let's start with a video we recently obtained from the ACLU of Maryland. It shows officers asking people for identification papers. I know it seems crazy. American police stopping American citizens on public sidewalks to prove that they have the right to be there. What you, I just took my daughter to school. What your idea? I don't have an ID. I just took my daughter to school. You got mail or anything to say you live here? Um, my house is right here. If you want me to put the key in okay. and let it see Calm that. Calm down. I'm doing my job, man. I West Franklin, you got your ID? Which yeah. part of West Franklin? Which part? You got your ID? Okay, how long have you lived here? Last five months. You, let me see your ID. I'm sure you're wondering why. Well, I'll tell you. It all started with this, the death of Detective Sean Souter. Souter was found shot in the head in West Baltimore in November of 2017. Former Police Commissioner Kevin Davis initially accused someone in the community of killing him. And to justify this accusation, he locked down an entire community for six days. Let me repeat, despite the fact that the police have no constitutional authority to take control of an entire community, they did just that. But Stephen, there's more to the story. What were police hiding from the public to justify this violation of their rights? And what was unique about the circumstances? Well, there are two things that were going on here. Number one, when this happened, Baltimore City had just entered a consent decree with the federal government after a Justice Department report found that the, that the Baltimore Police Department had practiced unconstitutional and racist policing strategy for decades. Right. So they were already under a, uh, a, a agreement with the Department of Justice to not violate the law and to, to stop the kind of practices. And secondly, Detective Sean Souter, the day before he was shot, was set to appear in front of a grand jury regarding right. the Gun Trace Task Force. Now, so for people who don't know, the Gun Trace Task Force is one of the most corrupt police units uh, ever to emerge from a very troubled police department. Eight officers uh, convicted or pled guilty or convicted of robbing residents, stealing drugs, uh, stealing overtime, all sorts of crimes. So uh, the, the commissioner at the time said that there was a resident, an African-American male wearing a jacket with a white stripe, who was a suspect and used that to justify that without any sort of reason to lock down you know, blocks and blocks of the Harlem Park community in West Baltimore, but at the same time knew that this could be tied to one of the worst scandals in Baltimore City Police history. So it really is an appalling you know, violation of the law and also what was going on in the department at the time where it was trying to say, hey, we're gonna make reforms. It was in the midst of a very you know, uh, protracted and engaged reform process and, and seemed to violate both tenets of that. So I want to follow up. A special panel ultimately ruled Souter's death a suicide. Mm -hmm. But what do the people in the community actually think of this? Well, what's interesting is that this, this particular case is sort of a prism through which to view the community's perception of police. And there's not a single person as a reporter that I've spoken to while investigating the story that believes that Sean Souter was, was, a, was a victim of suicide or right. killed himself, but rather a victim of police corruption or his own, was killed by his own. Now, you know, the evidence that the special review board, you know, pro-offered as a reason was, has been subject to some criticism, uh, including a surveillance camera that has a very grainy shot that seemed to preclude a suspect, the fact that he was shot with his own gun, um, there were three shots, all came from his own gun, um, blood spatter on his, on his shirt sleeve, but 
this all comes from the police department that no one really trusts. And so really the community doesn't believe anything that's come out of the police department regarding this and truly believe because he was in a position to expose even more corruption. Exactly. I mean, the basic concept is at, at that moment in the gun trace task force investigation, it had been limited to 2016. That was when the wiretaps had caught this group helping a, a drug outfit in Northwest Baltimore. Had Souter testified in front of this grand jury about a 2010 case that involved planting drugs on, on a person they had tried to rob, uh, it's possible the scandal could have gone higher and broader. And, and that's something that the community, I think, gives the community a right to question this because it, was, it could have been such a fundamental change in just the scope of the case. So to summarize, a department already under federal consent decree, the subject of a Justice Department report which concluded its tactics were both racist and unconstitutional, and the agency which spawned one of the worst corruption scandals in the history of policing, the Gun Trace Task Force, decided again to ignore the law. In fact, the so-called monitor appointed by a federal judge tasked with reporting on the BPD's compliance with the consent decree concluded just that, again, they ignored the law. But of course on this show, we don't just focus on a single example. We explore the entire system. And nothing could exemplify how systemic the problem with cops and lawlessness is than the most recent allegations to emerge from our prison system. Let's listen. All 25 of these correctional officers have allegedly abused their power and abused our trust. This is a disturbing case, but it does not represent nor should it cast a shadow on the commitment and integrity of the exceptional correctional professionals in this department. That was Baltimore prosecutor Marilyn Mosby announcing the indictment of 25 prison cards who she alleges were literally part of a criminal gang. The charges recount a systematic use of violence and abuse in Maryland prisons that Mosby claimed was part of an overarching criminal scheme. The guards were part of a special tactical unit that operated primarily out of Baltimore. Joining us today is someone who has had firsthand experience with them. Baltimore resident and hip hop artist, Michael Willis. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I hope I can add some points to this discussion. Yeah. So first I want to ask you, does the scope of the crimes described surprise you at all? Not at all. I'm wondering why it took so long. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what uh, initiated this whole process to begin. Um, the scope is probably even less than what it actually will end up being. Um, it's smaller right now. I think it'll grow. Um, yeah, uh, COs, uh, mm -hmm. prison policing uh, needs to be reformed. So you encountered this tax squad while you were incarcerated. Do you know what the purpose of the tax squad was actually supposed to be? The tax squad, we call them the goon squad. Okay. Uh, the inmates call them the goon squad, I should say. Um, their job was to... Uh, quell any uh, riots of any kind, mm -hmm. uh, extract inmates from their cell, uh, take care of the uh, things that other uh, COs, correctional officers, uh, didn't want to take care of or weren't trained or qualified to take care of. You know, interesting, in the, in the indictment, it says that they assaulted prisoners and that they used excessive force. But, you know, as we were talking before the show when we were discussing this, what constitutes excessive force? And are you surprised? Because it seems to me, from how you described it, they felt pretty much empowered to do what they wanted, right, to anybody. Yeah, the, <laughs> the COs, not just task force COs, but COs in general, but we're speaking about the task force. You have to understand that they are a elite group of C they're supposed to be elite group of COs. Right. Right. They're qualified, they're trained by the system to quell disturbances from inmates. So that automatically puts them in an elevated status among the other COs that surround them. Any kind of assault charges uh, formed against the officers would, would come from, I believe, um, something else it's right. it, it's not like right what you're saying is it, it, it this was common for them to beat up prisoners right it was not an uncommon event right yeah it's it's, yeah. it's absolutely not an uncommon thing so you're wondering like why would this particular set of circumstances rise to the level of where they would actually get indicted i think right that's what i'm that's that's yeah. the question i'm asking what precipitated this why yeah. why now their job is to actually put their hands on inmates by definition, that's assault. So if your job is to put your hand on an inmate, 
how can you charge someone who is supposedly doing their job with a crime? There right. must be something right. else involved. There's something else at play here. What does that say about our prison system that, you know, they knew they could physically abuse prisoners without any sort of, you know, law or any sort of regulation? What does that say about our prison system or any sort of sense of, you know, that tells accountability? You what I'm sorry, that tells, you, that tells you what the prison system thinks of the prisoners, with the inmates. Uh, COs, the task force, you know, that elite squad, they can do whatever they want to any prisoner at any time. And if they become excessive with uh, their hands-on approach, they write it up in a way that uh, prevents any kind of reprimand right. and relinquishes their... Uh, you know, their... Yeah, their, their responsibility for their it, responsibility basically. For so they, they basically all are kind of in on it. You know, it's, it's interesting that you were talking about the way they write things up, because I think one of the things that might have clued our state's attorney to investigate them is the fact that when there was any attempt to investigate, that they covered up evidence, that they intimidated witnesses, that they falsified documents. So it might have been the fact that they tried to thwart the vest investigation itself is what helped bring criminal charges onto them. So when Mosby actually, in this court doc, calls them a criminal gang. Um, they describe violent assaults. Uh, they describe um, putting their hands on people. Uh, one of the things they say is, their goal is to maintain dominance and use retaliatory tactics to suppress dissent, witness intimidation and tampering. From your experience, ha have you seen anything in the prison system that is actually helping rehabilitate people and help people? Or is it all about this control and dominance that I see listed here? Yeah, well, it's all about control and dominance and no, there isn't anything to rehabilitate the criminal. The criminal, it's like the old adage, we were talking about this, the criminal goes in an inmate and the individual goes in as an inmate and he comes out as a, as a criminal, a, a master criminal. You spend your time in jail, in prison, there's nothing to do but to refine your craft. I'm sitting here and I'm smiling and I'm, and I'm trying to find my words, but the point is, you know, my experience in the prison system, it's, it's, it's laughable because prisoners get no kind of uh, respect. We have no kind of rights. A CO can do whatever they wish to do to an inmate at any given time and not be held accountable. This is, la for anybody who spent, anybody who spent any time in prison or jail or county jail, they, they know this. And, um, I'm glad it's being dealt with now, but this is a long, long standing issue. Um, there's no separation. There's, there's no, uh, a CO doesn't stop. It's the old, it's the old uh, joke. You've seen the joke where the, uh, the, the police on the street uh, starts uh, assaulting someone that they're trying to apprehend. And the person that they're apprehending um, is not doing anything. They're not fighting back. But the police are pounding on that guy, and the police always say, stop resisting, stop resisting, when the guy is just standing, sitting there, ready to be subdued. That's the way it is in the, in the prison system. Uh, they would actually say that when they would be... be... No, they, didn't, they don't have to. Right. They when don't the, even have to. When wow. a police officer says, stop resisting, that's for everybody else. That's right. for people that can hear it. Right. But the only people that are around when they are putting their hands on inmates are other inmates. So there's no need for them to say, stop resisting. So are you saying an inmate's word doesn't count? And when it word means when nothing. It... Wow. It means absolutely nothing. Who are you going to believe? <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. It's just funny. Who you, I mean, it's like... It's like anywhere else when you're dealing with a prisoner or a former inmate. Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe a CO or are you going to believe an inmate, a criminal, a person who's in there for creating, a, for, for uh, you know, perpetrating a crime? Um, you're going to believe the outstanding CO who guards him. And, you know, it's just a whole way that people look at inmates in and out of prison. Well, you know, you not you have to get too specific, but... The, the CEOs there are still participating in bringing in contraband and doing things that are, you, you know, illicit drugs and things, right? You don't, I know you didn't want to be too specific. For right, I don't own. want to be too specific, but I'm, I'm, I'm in it, it still now. still goes on. Uh, Go ahead. You know, you, you, 
That's why I keep asking what precipitated all of these charges, because it cannot just be uh, one CO or two COs from a quote unquote elite unit uh, uh, assaulted an inmate. It has to do with, and from my opinion, it has to do with something else. And I have to follow the money and the money and the prison system. And there's a lot to be had there deals with the uh, intake of contraband into the specific prisons their self. Um, meaning drugs and... Meaning drugs. Or cell phones or cigarettes, uh, exactly. right? cell phones, cigarettes, drugs. And that mainly flows through the COs, right? There's no other way around it. There's no other way that you want to get... There are, there are other ways that you can get contraband into jails, but the most common way and the most sure fired way is through COs. COs bring it in. And it's big wow. business, right? It's absolutely huge business. I mean, if you think 10, 15,000 a month is small, I mean, then, then you're wrong. Well, what do you think when you're sitting there and you're like, you know, I've been accused of being a criminal, and yet I see this criminal organization basically running around me? Does it, how do you, how do you, can you reconcile that? Is it, what, no, when you're you, sitting? No, no, you don't reconcile it. You can't reconcile it. Nobody with a sane mind or a logical mind can reconcile it. You know, I'm in there as a criminal. I did what I do to get into jail. But then when I get there, I see all these illegal activities done by the people who are supposed to be upstanding. There's no line. You know, there's, there's no justice. And you sit there and you just bide your time to get out. And then the whole cycle of corruption and... Criminality continues. And yet when you get out of jail, you, you can't get a job because everybody brands you a criminal, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think probably 80, 85% of inmates who leave prison have trouble getting jobs. The first thing they check is your criminal record. And once that crime appears on your record, you're branded a crook and no one wants to hire you, period. And yet... The people that work in these prisons, the corrections officers, and people that commit these crimes, they go out of here as upstanding citizens, right? Absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a double standard. And it, if I sound defeated, it's because okay. I am defeated, you know? I just, I, I don't... I understand. I, I don't know how to reconcile it. Yes, I've seen criminal activities with COs. Yes, I've seen uh, COs... Uh, beat inmates to an inch of their life. Nothing happens. Um, everyone knows the contraband is going on, um, and no one really attempts to stop. The thing is that it's more about so cruelty than it is about the idea of reform or helping you m move on with your life. It's about cruelty. It's about cruelty, and it's about, as Taya said, uh, power. It's about someone having control over another individual while they're in jail. You know, that also sounds like it's about money as well. When I was just doing the research here, I saw that there's 12,000 employees in the, in the correct, in the, within this correction right. system, and it's a $1 billion industry. Business. So it's, it, well, business, right. really. No, I mean, no, that, you're right. That's, it's that's industry, incredible. but it's a business. You know? And then when you think of correction officers who may be making profit and money in their spare time, by doing the type of criminal activities that would have put someone in prison, it's just astonishing. It is just astonishing that something this corrupt could continue to run and be considered part of a just justice system. It's astonishing. It's America. So, Stephen, this isn't the first time that correction officers have been arrested no. here in Maryland, right? There was just a, a scandal, well, it was a federal indictment of corrections officers in the Baltimore City Jail, which is part of the same complex that this tag team works at, where um, a, a member of the Black Gorilla family, which is a local gang, was basically running his drug organization with the help of corrections officers. Um, uh, th from jail and and making a lot of money is what Mike was talking about. They were all making a ton of money, and I think what was really interesting about that scandal was the fact that the the gentleman who was running this thing was in was in jail. Which the difference is, it means he was awaiting trial, and he'd been in there for like three or four or five years. Wow. You know, people get lost in this system. I mean, Mike, you know this very well. You can have your trial coming up; it gets postponed and postponed, and you just sit there, right? That's correct. Yeah. So anyway, so this is not unusual for corrections officers to be profiting and also to be indicted. And it, it has been endemic. There has been a scandal on the Eastern Shore as well, which is part of Maryland, which is a south, southern part of Maryland, had 20 officers indicted. It is constantly ongoing. And, and what it says is 
it's a business. It's right. not a social institution. It's a business and it's profitable. And it's part of, I think, metaphorically speaking, part of the larger picture of subjugation of people, you know, it, in, for people in general, how the criminal justice system becomes a profit center for a certain segment of society, which are branded, as, as Mike said, upstanding, and the other segment, which is, is, a, is a part of the population that's profit off of, is branded criminal, like some sort of scarlet letter, and thus becomes a source of profit for people. And, and that's what we're seeing. You know, you can indict everyone you want, but you can't, you need to indict the system in this sense if you want to change it. So lastly, just to drive home our theme of trouble policing, I want to show you the video of an arrest that emerged last week. The video shows two tactical officers arresting Baltimore resident David Dixon. As you can see from the images we're showing now, the officers have Dixon in what appears to be a chokehold, but the video has been controversial for another reason. That's because the officers are indicative of an aspect of policing that we cannot mention enough, just how lucrative policing is and how that money is often tied to bad behavior. So Stephen, can you explain the tie yeah. between money here and what we just saw on the screen? Well, as we mentioned before, the gun trace task force scandal, one of the major things that the officers were accused of doing was stealing overtime. And the two officers that you're watching right now in this video make a lot of overtime. Right. One of the, the officer who is on top of the young man makes $130,000 a year according to Baltimore City uh, employee records. The other one makes 100000 And again, this drives home the point. You know, we as a city, one of the poorest cities in the country that cannot afford to help people like Mike get jobs, can pay police officers $130,000 a year to, to put a chokehold on a young man on the pavement to no good end, right? So you have to ask yourself what's, what's working. It's the imperative of profit that is driving it. This is what's driving policing. And, and, and this community, although we've had these horrible experiences with spe so-called specialized units, we're still doing it. We're still turning to that. Nothing changes. And the reason nothing changes is because it's profitable and there is a, a consortium of people who are profiting off it. And I, I guarantee you two years from now we'll be talking about more officers being indicted. And, and so what, what was stunning about this video is they're doing the same thing that they've been doing forever. So um, it's just another example of how money really is what policing is about in America. So let's be clear. This is a city under federal consent decree for racist and unconstitutional policing. This is a city still reeling from the Gun Trace Task Force scandal, which led to the indictment of eight officers for robbing residents, dealing drugs, and stealing overtime. A city that puts almost all its resources into cops while its schools go without heat and air conditioning is now showing that corruption is so systemic, it is simply part of the culture. Think about it. The commissioner made the decision to harass residents of Harlem Park for a week. The political power structure of the city continues to put tactical officers on the street despite scandal and failure and pays them generous salaries to harass the city's poorest neighborhoods. And then the state's correctional system tops it all off with a brutal gang of criminal prison guards. And it's all under the guise of enforcing the law. But it seems more about transferring wealth and punishing the poor. If that were not true, then read the charges against the 25 corrections officers. The document aligns with an ongoing theme of our reporting. The group of guards who brutally beat prisoners is a so-called tactical unit with a paramilitary structure. That's what the document says. That's right, law enforcement purposefully designating themselves as soldiers. But in this document, they use those powers, according to the indictment, to run a criminal gang. Let's remember, soldiers kill a military wages war. Why would we wage war on a captive group of people obviously in need of help into reintegrating into our society? Is inflicting cruelty really the answer? Maybe the answer to that question is what drives most of American policy. Who is getting paid? According to the state, the corrections division has a $1 billion budget. Our local police department, half a billion. And what do we spend on summer jobs for teens? About 8 million. And even more telling, far much less in schools roughly around 300 million. So are we really surprised when year after year, Baltimore descends into violence and chaos, when the city continues to be stricken with poverty and the population dwindles? Or is it just the result of allocating resources to reinforce poverty and class divisions all under the color of law? I guess the truth is you do get what you pay for. I'd like to thank my co-host Stephen Janis for his reporting and to thank our guest Michael Willis for sharing his experiences with us. We will be playing some of his music for you now. And I want you to know if you have evidence of police misconduct, please email me at parattherealnews.com or message me at Taya's Baltimore on Facebook or Twitter. And of course, at Eyes on Police on Twitter and the Police Accountability Report on Facebook. My name is Taya Graham, and I'd like to thank you for joining us. Be safe.